In the 1970s, the world came alive to the sounds of Roots reggae. I know I am bound here in it sang songs of revolution, morality and injustice and offered hope to ordinary people in times of immense political struggle. Bob Marley, Burning Spear, Peter Tosh and a whole leap of other artists brought this message from the ghettos of a small Caribbean island to the international stage. Stand up for your rights. Reggae music has become a voice of the Jamaican peasantry. It is the bedrock, I would say, of the expression of freedom. In Jamaica, it helped unite the country at a time of near civil war. I think most of Jamaican music is a reflection from the environment. That's why it is so raw, truthful and authentic. It was a music that kept everyone's sanity. In Britain, it was a cultural lifeline to a generation of young black people. It was just an occupation who hasn't been a young black man, you know? We were almost like the guinea pigs for a lot of the nonsense that was going on. You were kicked, you were beaten at the hands of racist police officers in this country. And its universal message crossed over to a much wider audience too. Roots Reggae really gave the listener strength. Roots Reggae has been a huge influence on everything I do as a musician, poet and political commentator. We say only working class people are racist. Do me a favour. We've been on this team for so long now. Even though I was born two years after Bob Marley died, like loads of people my age, I've grown up with this music. But it's something I've always taken for granted. So I'm on a journey much deeper into this culture that's been such an integral part of my life. But it's not just me. For millions of people, both in Jamaica and here in the UK, Roots Reggae has been more than just music. It's been a way of life. The Hackney Empire is one of the hubs of London's Caribbean community, where many of Roots Reggae legend has performed. I spent countless hours here growing up, and I've arranged to meet some of my elders to find out why this music has made such a connection. I wanted to gather you guys here today, you know, because you're largely responsible for Roots Reggae and my love for it. What was the opening moment that you thought, I love this stuff? When did reggae really hit your life? For me, it was when um, Exodus came out, Bob Marley, that album. In this Exodus, where are it just contained the energy at that time that encapsulated what was going on in the environment. And that is the magic thing about reggae music, is that reggae music has always been the voice of the, of the people, or the voiceless in that sense. Our parents weren't really too keen on listening to it, particularly. It wasn't what they wanted you to aspire to. But that really was a key source of identity at the time. This is where you stop watching Top of the Pops, you yeah? <laughs> You begin to understand music without lyrics and the power of the sound, which is important, the power of the soul, like the drum beat. And that's when you begin to get influenced and begin to understand, basically, what people all around the world are going through. Worrying about your earthly possessions, yeah. Don't make it, it was about suffering, basically. How to survive, you know what I mean? What the world is really like, basically, from that point of view. I you know, it was great to get some of my elders together in the same space at the same time. What really struck me the most was this sense that reggae music was so powerful, so forceful that it remade an entire generation's identity to the point where, you know, 40 years later, it still impacted the way they see themselves right up until this very day. If you would like a real vacation, having some fun and relaxation, if joy and happiness you would know, Jamaica, Jamaica is the place to go. Yes, Jamaica is I love coming back to Jamaica. The first time I came here, I was seven years old and I went to stay with my grandmother in her village for an entire summer. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life and I remember being blown away by just the sheer physical beauty of the place. That summer really shaped my relationship with the country. But now I'm older, 
I'm not blind to the challenges it faced and still faces. But despite those challenges, the Jamaican people have managed to make an indelible impression upon the world. Someone said to me recently, not since the Mediterranean island of Crete a few thousand years ago, has an island of comparable size exercised such disproportionate influence on global culture. And that may sound like an exaggeration, but when you think about it, it isn't. 2.5 million people, 150 miles long, yet you struggle to find anyone anywhere in the world who doesn't know the name Jamaica and the word reggae music. For many people, reggae has had that global impact because it's a political music with a message. But I want to get a sense of the musical ingredients that help reggae to become so successful. So my first port of call is to meet with two of reggae's most influential musicians. I've got jackfruit, which is always a plus. And I'm on the way to interview Sly and Robbie. And my dad sent me a comical message that they must be intimidated to meet such a legend. By which he obviously meant I must be a little bit intimidated to meet them. Thanks, Dad. And it's really impossible to overstate the role that Sly and Robbie have played in Jamaican music. And so you could say I'm slightly what we refer to in London as gassed. Hello, gentlemen. How you doing? Pleasure, pleasure, yeah, yeah, pleasure yeah, yeah. to meet you, pleasure. I tell you, I told both my parents I was coming to meet you guys today. Yeah. And they were so jealous. Don't kill me, you come around. As long as you're a black man. Between them, drummer Sly Dunbar and bass player Robbie Shakespeare have made thousands of recordings, playing with many of the reggae greats like Burning Spear and Peter Tosh. You are an African. When I was a child, I used to love ska music. It's so infectious and fun, and from what I was told, it forms the basis of the reggae rhythm. So can you show me, so for example, what would, it, what would a typical ska rhythm section be? Well, uh, go play some ska music now. Ska is like American R&B, but the accent is crucially on the offbeat, as heard here on Sly's hi-hat. The recording industry here didn't really start until the 1950s. And in the early 1960s, ska really took off. But one of the notable things about Jamaican music is that it's always evolving, and by the mid-60s, the rhythm changed again into rock steady. And so what about rock steady then? What would, what would define rock steady from ska musically? Could you show me a different? It kept that offbeat rhythm, but it was slower. Some people say to make it easier to dance to. Better get ready, come to rock steady. You got to do this new dance. As the 1960s came to a close, the beat changed once again, this time into reggae. The bass now start more, you know, in charge. Mm. Yeah, more melodic as well. Right, it's like right, the bass is leading, yeah, right, right. right? And the whole vibe of it just completely yeah. changes yeah. when you, you literally, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me about the bass, you know, the bass plays such a big role, particularly in Roots Reggae. What, what is it about the bass and Roots Reggae? What is the relationship? Well, to me, the bass is the instrument to me, mm. who changed the, the identity of the music. And as the reggae era entered the 1970s, the bass, as well as the political message, became the foundation for the Roots music that would dominate the decade. Bass and drums was the foundation of roots music. It was what people even used to um, identify a song. Even though the song was named something else, they, they would say, like, Fatty Fatty Bass Line, or the Book of Rules Bass Line, you know? Because the, the, the line, the bass line, it was the driving force of the music. But what you can't forget is that at the heart of Roots Reggae is a religious movement that emerged uniquely here in Jamaica in the 1930s, Rastafari. Most of the Roots Reggae artists I grew up listening to sang about Rastafari. Those records told me of a stolen African identity and of slavery and colonialism. 
From the 16th century, millions of Africans were brought over to work as slaves, forced into brutal hard labor by the Spanish and then the British. The University of the West Indies has been built on the site of two old sugar plantations. Do you remember the days of slavery? I've come to meet one of Jamaica's leading academics to see how Rastafari fits into the story of enslavement. What were the conditions like on these two plantations and in slave plantations of Jamaica more generally? Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, you take human beings, you try to turn them into objects. People resist. Mm -hmm. Jamaica is one of the countries in the Caribbean that had the most slave rebellions. Mm -hmm. And so it was a constant fight. And how does this history of oppression pave the way for Rastafari in Jamaica? Yeah, well, Rastafari became, in the early 20th century, a manifestation of this spirit of resistance. So it is that whole history of enslavement, mm. oppression, exploitation of labor that we see going right through into the 20th century. Mm. And that is what propelled the emergence of Rastafari. After nearly 400 years of slavery, over 90% of the Jamaican population was of African origin. That's a whole nation existing on an island knowing that their original home was thousands of miles away on the other side of the ocean. And of course, living under colonial rule meant they were forced to adopt their oppressors' customs. Many African cultures were lost. Carolyn's taking me to the first Rasta settlement. It really is an extraordinary story. It begins with the Jamaican Marcus Garvey. In the 1920s, he founded the largest ever Pan-African organization, to redress the historical injustices caused by colonialism. Its emphasis was on self-help, a new black civilization, and a partial return to Africa. Garvey won global support from the black working class. So when he prophesied a black king would be crowned to liberate the African diaspora, some of his Jamaican supporters took this to mean the 1930 coronation of Haile Selassie as the emperor of Ethiopia. A preacher called Leonard Howell was a member of Garvey's organization and he believed Emperor Haile Selassie was the black messiah returned to earth, known as Ja. Howell set up a religious commune to worship him, an alternative living space that rejected colonial rule. The movement was called Rastafari, combining Selassie's title and birth name. Yep. So, where are we? Pinnacle, right at the top. Look at the 360 degree view. Wow. So tell me a little bit, what, what occurred up here? Why is this place so important to Rastafari culture? Well, this is where Leonard Howell brought people out of the ghetto mm -hmm. to give them an alternative life. It was a space where people developed a sense of identity as different from the masses of the people left down mm -hmm. in Kingston. They were on an elevated plane. By the end of the 1940s, there were 5,000 people living here. Oh, yeah. But I can see why. They'd had their cultural identity stripped. Rastafari tried to rebuild it. But this self-sufficient community that purposely existed outside of colonial rule was seen as a threat to the state. Howell himself was arrested several times for sedition. Mm -hmm. He was challenging the state, mm -hmm. challenging the legitimacy of, you know, the colonial authority. Mm -hmm. Because he was preaching that Jamaica is not home. Revolution. A revolution. And so he was arrested for being a revolutionary, mm -hmm. somebody who was mashing up the system. By 1954, the authorities decided that threat was too great. They destroyed Pinnacle and chucked Howell in prison. It's sad. Today, Howell, like so many other historical figures, seems relatively unknown. This site, they can never erase the fact that Pinnacle represented black power. So let us rejoice. When Pinnacle was destroyed, where did all the early Rastas go? They went back to Trenchtown because that's where they had started from. But it was a loss of a grand vision. And so it took a long time for people to find themselves, build themselves back up and Reggae music became one of the means through which that transformation was accomplished. Let's go to church time. All right. To me, the purpose of Rasta seems not just religious, but also political, about reconnecting the African diaspora, who'd been taught to be ashamed of themselves and their African heritage, who'd suffered slavery and then racism on account of being black, to then reconnect them with their African heritage and say proudly, I'm an African. And furthermore, Africanness is divine, is an incredibly audacious statement. 
Jamaicans. So right now we're driving through Trenchtown. I mean, it's no secret, this is one of the roughest, most politically divided ghettos on the planet Earth. But at the same time, it's also a place that produced this deeply spiritual, beautiful, loving music. Almost a contradiction in terms, but a testament to human will. This is ground zero for reggae music, but certainly a place that is indispensable to the history of reggae music. It's pretty much the same today as it was back then, with many of reggae's most famous performers living in this area. After the destruction of Pinnacle, many Rastas returned to Trenchtown and began to make their influence felt mixing with the local musicians. Shortly after the move from Pinnacle, there emerged a person who was to become probably the most influential Rasta drummer, that is Count Azzy. Count Azzy is one of the reggae music foundation inspirations. He is considered to be the person who invents the beat that we recognize as reggae. Oh, Carolina aside, back then you really had to look for the Rasta influence in the music, even though by that time many of the musicians had converted to the religion. When you have locks in your head in Jamaica, it's a statement. There's a certain recognition or expectance of a certain consciousness when you put locks on your head. So today, it's much more accepted to look Rasta, but in the early 1960s, it was very different if you had dreadlocks. Rastas were scorned by mainstream Jamaica and thought of as vagrants or even criminals. The Rastas, as they're called, live normal, everyday lives. Leonard wanted us to meet his family, and if his children look wary, it's because they were scared of the camera, not their father. It's a re total rejection. Total rejection, because for in the early years, they would think that Rasta was a black art man that would kill you and do bad things to you. This was because of the society that we were living in and the rejection for the so-called Rasta man then. But not everybody in Jamaica thought like that. After the optimism of independence in 1962, poverty was still rife. Thousands converted to Rastafari in search of a spiritual solution to their tough lives. The Jamaican authorities responded much like their colonial predecessors. It all came to a flashpoint when the Prime Minister instructed the police to bring in Rastas dead or alive. Hundreds were beaten and chucked in jail, and some even killed. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, Jamaica's elite and foreign tourists were living it up, as always. Montego Bay, Jamaica, the last word in luxury tourism in the Caribbean. $1,500 to do right. nothing at all. That's right. Is it worth it? Sure. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome, sir. Despite the persecution, Rastafari was getting more and more popular. The Jamaican recording industry didn't yet reflect this. Some perhaps thought it was too controversial to release Rasta-inspired music. Plus, the Good Time Scar was proving very profitable and gaining a global audience. In 1964, Millie Small sold six million copies of My Boy Lollipop. It was fun, party music, and the start of a number of Jamaican singles hitting the UK charts in the 1960s. Some of the records sold well, but most Jamaican music still struggled to get recognition beyond the novelty status. Michael Riley was in the reggae band Steel Pulse, and he's an academic in black British music. He was a kid in the 60s, and at the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton, he tells me, apart from the odd hit record, it was really hard to hear Jamaican music on the radio back then. How did the broadcasting establishment in Britain respond to Jamaican music? Well, when you say UK broadcasters, back in the day, there's one main broadcaster, which is the BBC, which was considered the beast, the enemy. You're not going to get played by the beast because it has no affinity for your music. If you didn't get radio, you couldn't chart. If you didn't get radio, you couldn't get into press. So it was a, one way of suppressing the music. For kids like Michael, growing up in a society that seemed to deny you access to your heritage must have been hard. I get the distinct impression that sort of rejection extended way beyond just music and radio and what was a reaction to post-war Commonwealth migration. Even the teachers being racist in terms of, uh, so what would you like to be when you leave school, Michael? 
And I went, pilot? No, seriously, Michael, what would you like to be? And I went, I am being serious. Don't be difficult. I'm not being difficult, I'm simply answering a question. And for some of us, that meant that whatever is said, we're going to make it so. We're going to make it, you say I'm not going to be a pilot, I'm going to be a pilot. That's it. You guys have had it a lot easier. Well, I don't know about having it easy, but my generation may not have experienced the same degree of alienation that Michael's did. The music for them must have been vital in providing some sort of link back to where you came from. So I can imagine that when that music begins to tell you where you came from, it must really have resonated. And there was one event in Jamaica that inspired that message to appear in the music. Emperor El Selassie. In 1966, the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie was invited to Jamaica for a state visit. A crowd of 100,000 people greeted him at the airport, many of them Rastafarians. It seems the Jamaican authorities were surprised by the degree of support that Selassie had among their population. Dr. Clinton Hutton is a lecturer in political philosophy and culture. To meet you, he is also a Rasta and was a young man when the Ethiopian emperor first visited Jamaica. You can't write the history of post-colonial Jamaican society without writing about the impact of the visit of His Majesty. That visit was a major juncture in post-independent Jamaican society. A crowd never before seen in the history of the country gathered to meet a man in which a section of the Jamaican people see as the Almighty, as God. No government could have ignored that. For the followers of the Rastafari faith, it was the equivalent of Christ returning to earth. For everyone else, it showed Rastafari was a real religion and it was growing. The Rastafarians played a critical role in the development of Jamaican music post Selassie visits. And a whole pantheon of people started to wear dreadlocks in music. <laughs> One of those singers was Bob Andy. He'd been recording since the early 60s, but after the Haile Selassie visit, his music changed. Yes, sir. Akala, greetings. How you doing? Great. He's one of Roots Reggae's pioneers, and I went to meet him at his home in Uptown Kingston. What impact do you think that visit had on Jamaica as a country? For those who see His Majesty as God, God had, had arrived in the flesh. So you could argue it was sort of like, almost like a unifying event for Jamaica? It was, definitely was. Yeah. And it gave, gave a certain amount of validity to the Rastafari, new Rastafarian movement. Which it hadn't had up to that point? It was questioned. With the dignity of the man and his office and um, really just like a catalyst. More and more musicians like Bob Andy now had the confidence to start writing songs about Rastafari and the suffering it spoke of. I think most of Jamaican music is a reflection from the environment. Mm. That's why it is so raw, truthful and authentic. We've always been hungry. We're always broke. Mm. And so you sing about what you know. As the reggae era developed in the late 1960s, conscious-minded groups and singers began to emerge from the tough streets of Trenchtown. Harmony Trio, the Abyssinians, set the template with the soulful Rasta anthem, Satamasagana, which means give thanks in the Amharic language. At this time, cheap recording studios sprang up all over the Jamaican capital. So when the established record labels refused to release Rasta music, groups like the Abyssinians simply recorded themselves in small, affordable studios like this one. Back in the day, Roots artists like Burning Spear and Max Romeo all recorded here at Studio 17. It's strange to think of all these big names crammed into this hot little room, but you can almost see their fingerprints left in the dust.
This is called a lathe, aka a scully, aka a master dub machine. So the way it would work is songs would be recorded right here, bounce off one stop shop, boom. So if you're cutting a dub plate, which is a one off special for a DJ, you could just press it right there and go play it. Or they would cut the master record that they would make all the copies for right here. So it's sort of a one stop shop, record shop, recording studio, and a pressing plant all rolled into one. So a very entrepreneurial spirit. This is the way things were done. Anyway, I need to go uh, find a towel to wipe this sweat. In many places in Jamaica, to listen to Rastafari music, you'd have to go to the dance hall. It wouldn't be played on radio, and certainly it wouldn't be played on certain days. It wouldn't be played on a Sunday, for example, because Sunday was considered to be reverent and Christian, and rebel music was not fit for that. So the way to get your music heard was to take your dub plate to the sound systems. This network of mobile discos that traveled the island were key in popularizing roots reggae. They gave rise to the DJ or toaster, some of whom became superstars chatting Rasta themes over the speakers. And there's only one person to tell me about all of that, Big Youth. I went to his neighborhood in the center of Kingston. As a pioneer DJ, talk to me about what that means. For people who don't know, what is a DJ in Jamaican music culture? All right, a DJ was Really like the preacher, the teacher. Okay. Yes, teacher. I oh, know. Yeah. Back in the days, like, it was a lot of, yeah, 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 and this, yeah, 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 and baby, baby. Ain't, ain't no message. Yeah. You understand? Because it wasn't bringing people together. It wasn't telling people to make love and not war. Because war is ugly and love is lovely. <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. So. With, do you see that as the DJ's function to bring a message into the music? That's what the DJ is all about. That's 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 the change that the man you're talking to right now make within the music. Yeah, when we bring in the cultural, spiritual vibration to communicate with the people, ain't it? Big Youth was one of the first openly Rasta artists to get on the mic at a sound system, evangelizing conscious messages of peace and love. His Screaming Target album was one of the biggest selling records of 1972. God, the sound system is like the radio stations of the ghetto. That's where people can come and gather and gain knowledge, morality. You understand? Reggae, reggae music is a thing that brings family together, brings people together. Led by Big Youth, the DJ scene took Jamaica into the roots reggae era, often employing a new production style called dub as the platform for the lyrics. But it was ultimately a singing group who took Rasta and reggae to the world. Bob Marley and the Wailers were already a famous ska act, but by the end of the 1960s, they were growing their dreadlocks and writing catchy reggae songs about ghetto life, Rastafari, and Pan-Africanism. I cannot remember who else came on with strong, positive, conscious lyrics like the Wailers. Bob Marley and the Wailers managed to communicate radical Pan-African politics to a huge audience through extremely well-crafted pop music. By the early 1970s, Bob and the Wailers were one of Jamaica's top acts. Read me, read me, baby. I think what seems to be coming clear is that there was a period in the late 60s and then coming into the early 70s where a few different forces coalesced. There was the you know, tumultuous political times that Jamaica was going through. Then the long musical grounding that the musicians had had from massive influences of African-American soul and blues. But even people like Jim Reeves, who many people might not realize is you know, massively popular here in Jamaica. So there were all these different forces that came together at once, along with the history, the Marcus Garvey, Sam Sharp, and of course, Haile Selassie, that meant at that particular moment, all those forces could come together and create this brilliant kind of folk musical tradition. Hey! 
Now this Desmond Decker track is one of the big reggae tunes I grew up with. I really love this record and it's one of the reggae songs that made it big in Britain at the end of the 1960s. But reggae music still wasn't taken that seriously in the UK and as that decade ended, apart from a smattering of great records, the stuff supported by the mainstream was of the lighter pop variety. Basically, you were going to struggle to hear serious reggae on British radio in the early 1970s. Yes, sir. Dennis Bravell is one of British reggae's pioneers. You know what? I think we met once before, you know. He was a teenager back then, and he remembers discovering this early Jamaican roots music at Sound Systems. And something that's very unique to the British Caribbean community, the blues dance. They were private parties, and they went on all night. Someone would bring records over from Jamaica and we were dancing to it. We weren't just standing around drinking coffee or drinking alcohol and listening to it. We were actually actively engaged, you know, in, in smooching and, you Finding know... some wallpaper. May getting to know each other. Yeah. You might see a column of speakers that would be about the size of a wardrobe yeah. or two and the sound coming out of it would be thunderous. Yeah. Through the blues parties and sound systems, you'd get to hear early roots acts like Bob Marley and the Wailers, Big Youth and Burning Spear. And for Soul to Soul's Jazzy B, who grew up in London's sound system culture, it was more than a musical education. It was about information. A lot of it was talking about Rasta and our culture and our history. So a lot of us were picking up things basically literally just off a record before most of us um, started to read books or even get into books. Because for most guys growing up in those days, reading books and stuff was a little bit like kryptonite, you know? It was um, an interesting thing, the whole educational system and what we were striving for. Um, but equally in saying that, all the information was there. Through music, it seemed to transcend a little bit easier. Through blues dances, people outside of the Caribbean diaspora were properly introduced to Jamaican music for the first time. Future punks, the ruts, were among them. As a teenager, I started getting invited to blues parties, and you know, in houses where you, you know, bath full of beer, cut the bob at the door, all the furniture would be gone, and there'd be speakers in all the rooms. You know, I'm saying this for the viewers, because you don't know what a blues party. Been to a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> but what was real eye opener for me was that there'd be aunties and grannies, and the music would start, and everyone would be getting down, and it would be like freedom, you know, free, about to express themselves, a bit of sexuality in the dancing, and I thought, wow. It was through sound systems and blues parties that Roots Reggae began to build up a grassroots following on the streets of Britain. But it was Bob Marley and the Wailers that would really break through. After signing to Island Records, they were presented to the UK market like a rock band, and through clever marketing and network TV performances, they got mainstream exposure. Bob's songs seem to really strike a chord with a wide British audience. I mean, the thing is, when you think, he wrote quite feisty songs, quite revolutionary songs, but in a beautiful framework. Without you know, hate. With that, without any hate. hate you know, it was just, so, he, I think, you know, as white people, you weren't, he wasn't alienated, it was about unity. And without saying it, he was blessed to be that teacher, that prophet. I, that's what it felt like. After Eric Clapton's international hit version of Bob's I Shot the Sheriff, the Wailers were getting pretty famous. By the time Bob played London's Lyceum as a solo artist in 1975, he was a superstar. All the way from Trenchtown, Jamaica, Bob Marley, the Wailers, come on! 
Marcia Griffiths was on that journey with Bob, singing backing vocals. That night was when I think the music just took off like a rocket. He was definitely on another level. This is the man that has come to really spread the gospel of reggae music and take it to the four corners of the earth. That was one of the moments that I realized that this is bigger than us, much bigger and much deeper. Bob Marley brought the red, golden green, dreadlocks and Rastafari to international attention. A whole heap of new artists followed in Bob's footsteps, bringing with them some serious protest music. In 1976, Jamaica was in a state of emergency. The economy was a disaster, and the election year brought with it violence that divided the nation. It devastated Kingston. Witnessing it all firsthand was journalist Vivian Goldman, who was sent over to Jamaica by the New Musical Express. Jamaica in the mid-70s was a very volatile place because a lot of it would happen downtown in the places with little sanitation, no street lights and no education, but, but guns. It just seemed like human life was of so little account. There's always tribal and rival gunshots firing in the street. You have to be ducking. Even though it's happening now, you don't even have to duck too much. They come and hold you and kill you. Because it's the same injustice. Yes? Whilst the social deprivation of Trenchtown is still clearly visible today, playing with the children and chatting to elders, it's hard to imagine this place was like a civil war back then, with 200 people being murdered. Political violence, corruption, and a constant influx of foreign guns ravaged Jamaica's ghettos. Artists like Prince Farai, The Gladiators, and Max Romeo reacted the only way they knew how, through the music. They inspired and gave meaning to the lives of many people, and this was a transmission of a powerful vibe for survival. Even if you were wearing, you know, shoes with the soles flapping off, you know, you could have, a, you know, a spark in your spirit. And the music gave you that sense of worth. This is we don't want no more war. People weren't listening to the government. They were listening to the message in the music. The Prime Minister desperately needed that connection, so he asked Bob Marley to headline a peace concert. Bob's backing singer Marcia felt mixing music and politics was dangerous. I felt something in the ear that was not right. And I am at the rehearsal every single night for this particular political concert. And the one night I left, I told Bob that I had a concert in New York, which I never did, but I had visions of things happening. Marcy was right. Two days before the concert, gunmen burst into Bob's home. His manager and wife were shot, as was Bob, the bullet missing his heart by inches. You never saw the gunman? Well, at that time, no. But you know who did it? Yeah, I know that. Were they caught? No, but I don't call the police. Mm. Just, you know, what I'm saying. It was sad. It was, but it was celebratory. It was highly celebrated because he survived. And came back to perform just a couple of days later. Yes, you know. Do you think that increased Bob Marley's status almost as a, as a messiah to get shot and then perform two days later? Not knowing whether the gunmen who tried to kill you are stood there right there again. in the audience? I'm sure all of that added up became a component, a, a, a valuable component. Almost gave him a mythical yes, quality, almost. Yes, in, it's... The bulletproof Rustaman. Yes. But Bob wasn't bulletproof, and that night, he showed his wounds to the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
After that Smile concert, Bob left Jamaica for London and didn't return home for nearly two years. Just thinking about that shooting 40 years later, the idea that a country's most famous star, their national hero, could nearly be murdered, it must have felt like nobody was safe. But back in Britain, we were having problems of our own. The second half of the 1970s saw the rise of the National Front and racist policing tactics that would eventually culminate in a series of riots. Roots Reggae became the soundtrack to all of this, and I wanted to find out from my relatives what this music meant to them at that time. I think a lot of my generation are fortunate to not have fought some of the battles that your, your generation fought. But in that moment when Roots Reggae arrived, what was it like being a young black male on top of that? Maybe you've got dreadlocks in your head, on top of that, maybe a Rasta. What was that melting pot of forces kind of like in 1970s UK? I mean, in terms of the reggae music, I think that gave very available identity and standard to stand behind. Mm. or to rally around more like, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. For a lot of black people, mm. it was an immediately unifying force. Mm. You could be in the deepest amount of trouble, you would hear that tune, and suddenly for them three minutes, or whatever it was, you would feel better. It just uh, had that uplifting that, that uplifting in it, you, 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 you see what I mean? You saw a lot of people embracing reggae for the first time, not just black people. It became a very popular force and a, and a symbol of rebellion. Black musicians in Britain began to use roots reggae as a means of expression for what they were experiencing on the streets. Brothers and sisters rocking, a dread beat pulsing fire. Um, so I'm about to meet someone whose music's been a great impact on me, who's a poet I respect a whole lot, who I've interviewed before um, and can be a challenging interviewee. His name's Linton Kwesi Johnson, and for me, he's one of Britain's greatest poets of the last 50 years. In the 1970s, he combined dub, roots reggae and poetry as a direct response to what he was going through as a young black man living in London. Wherever large numbers of black people were gathered together, the brutality we were receiving, for reasons best known to themselves, the police saw that as some kind of a public order threat. You say the brutality, what, what, what do you mean? What were some of the specific things? What do you mean, what do I mean by brutality? Physical brutality, you were kicked, you were beaten you know, and, 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 and framed and, and uh, on trumped up charges of assaulting a police officer. A police officer would come and stand on your foot, for example, and if you push him forward a bit like that, he'd say you'd assaulted him. And that was pretty routine and normal? Oh, yes, I mean, it was commonplace. Those days of the truncheon and those nights. A whole section of my generation were criminalized under the SUS law. SUS being short for suspicion, the old Vagrancy Act was used by racist police officers to criminalize black youth. You, you know, you were, you were, you would be arrested and charged with attempting to steal from persons unknown. You were charged, no victim was produced. Could you still get a criminal record off the back of this court case where there were no victims produced? Well, of course, this is what, exactly what I'm saying. So people went to prison of course. for attempting to steal from victims unknown? Of course. All we're doing is defending, so get you ready. You know, I, I wasn't there at the time, but to really hear it from someone firsthand, just how brutal or how normal the brutality from the state and from ra racists and others was at the time is really, it still kind of gives you a, an uneasy feeling, just the normality of the people that are supposed to protect you, brutalizing and stereotyping you, whether you're involved in badness or not. In the second half of the 1970s, a wave of Roots reggae bands emerged in Britain. Many of them came from London, like Aswad, Misty and Roots, and Matumbi. But one of the most political came from Birmingham. They were called Steel Pulse. They come from Handsworth in the Birmingham area, in Birmingham, in fact. Not exactly a leafy suburb. Their latest album is called Handsworth, and here the revolutionary reggae sounds of Steel Pulse. Yeah. Birmingham had one of the largest Caribbean communities in the UK, and as Steel Pulse's Michael Riley told me, racism in that city was a real problem. Tension was building, and it would eventually boil over into the riots of the 1980s. If I go for a job and me and you are mates, you're white and I'm black and you'd come out and go, yeah, yeah, I've got a job, Mike, yeah, yeah, go on in, it's your chance for the interview. And I'd go in and they go, sorry, mate, there's no jobs. 
and you suddenly realise there's a difference between us. We might get on as mates, but there's a difference between how the world is now viewing us. In terms of the band, we're taking on that difference. We're looking at that in terms of the lyrics, and we're realising we have to become increasingly more deliberate, and we start to express that difference in the clothes. I made the clan hoods to make that statement on stage. When that Clue Clacks Clan single came out, we just, I, I was like, wow, this is so, so radical, really. And the way they dressed, whoa, this is proper it's rebel music, show, proper yeah, rebel music. We had to find our own identity and we had to accept our Britishness. But there's a point at which we said, look, we can't fake being Jamaican anymore, it doesn't work. We are who we are, and we should embrace that. This is our sound. It's a British roots reggae band. End of. And what was really interesting is the way in which the UK-based sounds tried to step away from a little bit what was going on in Jamaica and find their own identity. They might not have felt fully British, but they certainly weren't fully Jamaican or Trinidadian or whatever else anymore. And it was trying to find that new thing that was of Caribbean origin, but UK based. Back in Jamaica, the political violence was at its peak in 1978, and the knock-on effect to the poor communities was devastating. Roots reggae artists were continuing to reflect what was going on. They were the new service of the ghetto, hitting the charts with protest songs. This is so far as time. time, children, time. It was hoped reggae could influence a ceasefire. That April, the two rival factions at the centre of the violence called a truce. In a show of unity, a peace concert was organised at the National Stadium. Big Youth, Inner Circle and the Mighty Diamonds were all on the bill. Ex-whaler Peter Tosh was there too, now one of the most controversial and popular singers in Jamaica. Bob Marley was even persuaded to return home to headline. New Musical Express journalist Vivian Goldman was there. The atmosphere at the One Love Peace concert was exultant and, I mean, joyous because there was that moment of hope for the people at the bottom of the social heap who were carrying the brunt of the burden, the people who were starving. Vivian was lucky enough to witness one of the most dramatic events in Jamaican political history. At the climax of his performance, Bob Marley showed just how powerful Roots Reggae and Rastafari had become. With lightning crashing over the stadium, the singer demanded both the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition get up on stage. Two men whose political supporters were in bitter conflict. Two men who allegedly despised each other. It's got to be one of the most revolutionary moments in popular music. Only Bob Marley could do something like that. No one else. And we knew that this was one positive vibration. And this was like a seal. You know, this is something that Jamaica wanted. The prospect of peace, you know, the bonfires burned all night in the downtown areas and lot cousins who'd been at, at war with each other were able to embrace. Oh, it was a fantastic sense of release. It was an incredible feeling knowing that also many eyes around the world were focusing on this victory, even though the victory was short-lived because a lot of the engineers of the peace concert were dead soon after by violent means. Looking at the stadium today, it's sad to think that a concert that promised so much hope ended up as just a break in the violence. That time was so volatile and dangerous that the people had to turn to music for help. It seems the authorities were genuinely worried about how much influence these artists had. That same concert, Peter Tosh spent half an hour haranguing the Prime Minister, the police and the authorities about the political situation right to their faces. 
A few weeks later, he was dragged from a street corner into a local police station. Robbie Lynn, keyboardist for Peter Tosh at the Peace Concert, has come to meet me to tell me what happened next. He kind of went through a very bad beating inside. You know, we musicians went there, but we couldn't do anything. We were not allowed to come anywhere near inside, and you could hear, you know, the, the effects of, you know, the, the, the type of um, punishment they were inflicting on him. He was literally crying. Even Bob Marley was called. He came to the station. You know, we figured that he might have had some sort of influence. You know, Pete was always going to be controversial anyhow, because he always had something to say. For a moment. Roots Reggae had the power to halt the violence, but in reality, the problem was just too big. Add a huge international debt into the mix, and Jamaica's problems got much worse. Back in Britain, we were about to have our own problems. Unemployment was high, the young working class felt at the bottom of the heap. Times were tough. But Roots Reggae and Rastafari were now a visible presence on our city streets. And disaffected white kids were beginning to identify with their message. There's that expression that was popular in Rastra, roots reggae, I and I survive. So that was terribly important, because what does it mean? It means, you know, I've got to survive, but not only I myself, but also I and I, which is I and my, and my team, the people around me, my community. I honestly think that absorbing and thinking about those Rastra ideas and ideals gave you confidence in oneself that one could confront situations and find the strength to deal with them. By 1977, the punk scene embraced Roots Reggae, much to the surprise of Steel Pulse's Michael Riley. Yeah, we totally get what you say, Mike. And I'm going, really? <laughs> and then you sit down and talk to them, and actually, they did understand. They were equally disenfranchised um, from the system. They started to quote Babylon this, Babylon that, in the same way. And you go, what do you know about Babylon? <laughs> and they'd give you a lot of stock and barrel of how they're disconnected and they're fighting the system. You know, Babylon was just the word of the Rasta philosophy, really, that just basically means the poisoned part of the Western civilization, and we all be living in London, one could argue we lived in Babylon, and it was burning because people were fed up with it. While British streets were simmering with racial tension, punk and reggae bands were sharing the same stage. Really the first time black and white musicians had mixed on this scale. The feeling, I'm remembering it, you know, of being in a room with a, a, a black band playing, a reggae band playing, a punk band playing, and everybody bopping about, fantastic feeling, you know, and I think that it showed that you could do that. By the end of the 1970s, it seemed reggae and rasta were everywhere. Bob Marley was a superstar, punk bands like The Clash were covering Roots reggae songs and having top 10 hits. Every record company now wanted a piece of the action. But then, in 1981, Bob Marley died at the age of 36. Jamaica lost its favourite son. And without Bob, Roots Reggae lost much of its international popularity. Things just moved on. But of course, its presence has been felt ever since. Conscious Roots Reggae has become part of brand Jamaica due to a whole generation of very, very gifted musicians and songwriters who created this wave of conscious roots reggae that made Jamaica the epitome of people's hopes worldwide of what music could do to elevate consciousness. Today, you can see both roots reggae and Rastafari in the Jamaican mindset, the language, the fashion, and even the food. It's the spirit of the nation and one of the enduring images of that Caribbean island. And there are signs that Roots Reggae is making a comeback. Jamaican artists like Chronix and Protégé are spearheading a revival. They're taking the music in a new direction, but it's still grounded in Rastafari with a political message. It's making an international impact.
So through doing this documentary, I really got an even deeper sense of just how much roots reggae music wasn't just music, it was a form of news and a shaper of identities. And when you look at the impact it had here in the UK in the 70s, that's exactly what it did. It shaped an entire generation's worldview. And for people like me, whose parents brought them up listening to roots reggae music, well, the legacy of that can be heard in all forms of uniquely British dance music, drum and bass, jungle, garage, and of course, right. Welcome to a The roots and rebellion of reggae have deeply influenced my own work. But what I've taken most from the music is its message of resistance to oppression and speaking truth to those in power. Yeah.